Hi folks, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are uh, so excited to have the speaker here. Let's just hope that I do everything in the right order. Uh, my name is Sarah Cornell. I am the Supervisor of Technical Services uh, for the Portsmouth Public Library in New Hampshire. Uh, for those of you who are joining us from farther afield, um, even though we do have a lot of people here from the southern tier of New Hampshire, um, that we are a, a small city, a small medium city on the actual coast of New Hampshire, our uh, 18 miles of coastline we are very proud to have. Um, and uh, we start all of our meetings with a land acknowledgement. The city of Portsmouth is on the homelands of the Abenaki people who have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this area. According to tribal oral tradition, Abenaki people have lived in the place now called New Hampshire for more than 12,000 years since before tribal memory. The Abenaki are part of a larger group of indigenous people who call themselves Wabanaki or quote, people of the dawn and form one of many communities connected by a common language family. Here at the Portsmouth Public Library, we are committed to acknowledging and honoring the human history tied to this land. Um, we, have had, this is our fourth event in the Habitats and Harvest series, um, a series that we are, uh, that Robin and I have started planning February of this year. I think it was February, possibly a little later. All I know is it felt like it was not enough time. And um, we have hosted um, Russ Cohen on uh, foraging, Vicki Brown on Habitat for Wildlife, um, or Gardening for Wildlife, and Acadia Tucker on Tiny um, Victory Gardens so far. You can view Russ and Vicky's talks on the, uh, the library's YouTube channel. Um, and Doug Talmy um, has given us permission, gracious permission, to share his talk in the same place. So wherever you go to get the library um, recordings, it will be there in about a week once we get it edited. Um, and if it takes a little longer, please give us a little bit of breathing room as we get all of our staff back from various breaks and vacations. This actually, the topic was a suggestion from a patron. So one of our regulars sent an email suggesting that we do something on native plants, and we took something on native plants and we ran with it. Um, so if you do have suggestions for programming, please do get in touch with us about them. They do actually go somewhere. We have two other events, uh, even though this is the end of this particular series, um, we have two other events that are coming up that we, we think you might also like. On July 7th from 7 to 8 p.m. there will be a, an, a, a Let's see, Moose, Turtle, Bear, and More, Abenaki Tales from the Northeast Woodlands. Uh, Ann Jennison, who is a, an amazing storyteller, um, will be um, telling stories in keeping with the theme for our summer reading program. And I'm pretty sure it will be good for adults as well as children, even though you may find that it is part of our children's summer reading program. Um, we are also um, in a... Um, and a few months of transition back to um, in-person programming, but all of our in-person programming right now is outdoors. So if you are a local um, uh, joining us, um, please, you are welcome to join us for an outdoor guitar Sunday uh, event. This will, this will be a regular event in the, um, under the tent outside, um, uh, under the tent in the field next to the library that we often use for events. Um, it's, a uh, the Guitar Sunday is a, a series that we've had for many, uh, it has to have been at least five years, or am I just making that up, Robin? Um, so we, people are, will be really pleased to have the Guitar Sundays back. Um, and let's see if I can remember, it's, I think that's all of the things that I was supposed to tell you that were um, not related to tonight. So, uh, we are so inc incredibly proud. I personally, I, I apparently was the one who suggested um, inviting uh, Doug to, to, to speak to you tonight. Um, I didn't remember that, but I guess I'll take credit because I have read um, two of his books uh, and they made a huge impact on just solidifying how I thought about what to do with my guard um, here in coastal New Hampshire. Um, Doug Tallamy is the TA Baker Professor of Agriculture 
in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he's authored 104 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. The chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions de determine the diversity of animal communities. Um, he has I have three books, four, four books that I wanted to call out for you. Um, we uh, have access to all of his books in print as well as on Overdrive and or uh, Hoopla, two of our um, online resources. So if you are a Portsmouth Public Library uh, patron, please do go find them. Um, I'm pretty sure that Robin will put a link to that link or a link to that list rather um, in the chat. Um, and then you'll be able to see the, um, actually all of the books by, from the speakers that we've had as, uh, as part of this Habitats and Harvest series. Um, and Doug will be speaking to us tonight on the topic of Networks for Life, your role in stitching the natural world together. So please join me in welcoming Doug Tallamy. Thank you very much, Sarah. It is a pleasure to be here tonight. It's pretty warm down here in Southeast PA, but I hear it's warm up where you are as well. So a good time to sit in our air conditioning if you have it, I hope. All right, uh, before I talk about uh, uh, Networks for Life, I want to revisit what happened on the East. In 2019, we had what we call an oak mast where members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. This is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I am easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a hole for its head and it stuffed its head capsule through there. Then it stuffed its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze, looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down. Um, this is a, a very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. So a lot of things are after it. It gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. This is what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think Weevils have big noses, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn and turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that's how the larva gets down there. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the next year as most insects do? And the answer is that it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. After the acorn leva weaves the acorn, that leaves a hole, uh, a true vacuum, and you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the hole made by uh, acorn weevils when they leave the acorn. And if they find a new hole, a new acorn, they get excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it is time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs. The entire colony moves into the new hole in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard here to make sure nobody else comes in. And this is where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point? Uh, very simply that that is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of, of oak acorns. The relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they feed their young, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants and you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have this plant, facilia, because that is the only plant that, the only pollen that that particular bee can, can reproduce on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have uh, oh, about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them are highly specialized. They can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. So for example, in New England, there's uh, about 13 species of native bees that can't reproduce unless they have the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all evening about nature specialized relationships. But the point I wanna make is that these relationships today 
nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Problem is, we can't leave the country as it was because we haven't. Uh, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We have introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that sustain us. You know, when you take a large habitat like this and you shrink it down to a small little remnant of that habitat, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that is the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. In bad times, they go down. If you're a large population, this top line, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals that you can increase quickly when times get, get better. But if you're a tiny population, often in your down cycle, you hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch, uh, and then you're gone unless you, you recolonize. And so many of our habitats are so isolated that recolonization is no longer an option. Then you're permanently gone. That's called local extinction. So why have we fragmented the world the way we have? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I suspect we thought that, that our nest, planet Earth, was so big we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any, any consequences. But of course we were wrong about that and that's why we're seeing pretty scary headlines these days. Like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America's lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years, 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's almost a third of our North American bird population already gone. The UN says, hey, we're gonna lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. And I love the way they report this as if it's just another headline. They might as well say, we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on as if it doesn't matter. It does matter, folks. Losing a million species is not, not an option. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, this upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, the great E.O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus at this point, greatest entomologist of all times, told us what it would mean if, uh, hum if, if, if earth were to lose its insects. And he did it way back in 1987 in, in this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, those food webs would collapse and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself and thus ourselves, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, let me, let me remind you that we humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on nature and what we call uh, ecosystem services, our life support systems. That's what nature does, not just for us, but for everything else on the planet. Here's some of the things that plants give us. Producing oxygen, pretty important. Clean water, 
Uh, you know, it's plants that slow water's journey. Once it falls from the sky, it tries to get to the sea where it's too salty to use, but plants slow it down, allow it to infiltrate into the water table so that we can use it later on. Plants are capturing carbon, removing it from the atmosphere out of, harbin, uh, carm, out of harm's way, building their tissues out of that carbon, and then pumping the extra carbon through their roots into the ground. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. Plants are building topsoil and holding it in place. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather. They're converting sunlight to food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight all by ourselves. That would be tricky. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So developing landscapes like this, designing landscapes like this, that destroy the production of ecosystem services, it's just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but uh, today it's a downright terrible idea because we need more ecosystem services today than ever before. We've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. They all need ecosystem services. So taking huge areas of the planet out of production uh, in, in the name of a status symbol is just not a good idea. There have been uh, visionaries who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with, with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the, the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is that the, the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups who have been, been able to do that for a long time, like 12,000 years. That's, that's good. But, you know, our huge Western societies, our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing. Clearly not sustainable behavior. So Allah had a dream that we, uh, we humans actually could develop what he called a land ethic. In this dream, he, he, well, he knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine. But he dreamt that we could learn to do those things gently enough that we didn't destroy local ecosystems. And that's what he called a land ethic. He wrote about it in Sand County Almanac. What he never talked about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that, that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the, the culture of Aldo Leopold's day still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. But what I wanna argue this evening is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We, now, we need to save nature, actually reconstruct it where there are a lot of people, uh, because that's almost everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every single year, but thrive. Where are we gonna start? Well, let's go back to private property. Most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail. We've got parks, we've got per preserves, but they are too small and they are too isolated from each other to sustain the ecosystems that we need. So we now need to do conservation outside of those parks and preserves. And that means we need to do it on private property. There are a number of, of options for conservation, opportunities for conservation, I should say, that we're not taking advantage of. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? We've got 21 million acres in those types of of rights of ways. And just, just for perspective, 1 million acres is one and a half times bigger than Rhode Island. So 21 million acres, it's, it's a big chunk of land. Railroad rights of ways, another 3 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Roadside, 17 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. You know, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big places. Then we have all the places we, we, where we live, rural areas, suburbia, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those types of landscapes. So if you add up just those areas and you can think of other places, that's 599 million acres where we could be doing conservation where right now we're, we're not taking full advantage. How big is, is 599 million acres? It's big, it's 
bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, plus California, even throw Texas in there. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We can do conservation almost anywhere. Now, when I talk about conservation, I'm not using the word correctly. I'm really talking about rebuilding nature where we've dismantled it. But not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. Not all species support nature equally. So we need to start with the building blocks and then we can add other species later. There are two groups we can't do without. Uh, one is the, the flowering plants and then the pollinators that uh, enable those plants to reproduce. Those plants are capturing energy from the sun through photosynthesis, turning it into food, and then storing it in their tissues. Typically, they're their leaves. Well, now we have the, the energy from the sun stored in plant leaves, but if we're going to have any animals on the planet, we've got to get that energy to those animals. Most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates. Uh, so, and it turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So when we're designing, redesigning places for nature, they've got to include a lot of caterpillars or we will have failed food webs, which means we'll have failed ecosystems. Let me give you an, uh, an example from the Carolina chickadee. Now you've got the black capped chickadee up there in New Hampshire doing exactly the same thing. Uh, during the wintertime, those birds are at our feeders eating seeds, and we tend to think that's all chickadees need. Uh, you know, even in the wintertime, only half their diet is seeds. The other half is insects. But when they are reproducing, their babies cannot eat seeds. So they, they, they give up on seeds, and they feed their babies exclusively uh, insects. And it turns out that if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And it also turns out that chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects and most of those insects turn out to be caterpillars. How do I know that? Uh, well, um, there's a lot of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a project one of my graduate students did, a citizen science project. Ashley Kennedy put out a call for bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to the nest. And the object was they were going to take pictures of, of uh, the prey items that were in the beak and then send those pictures to Ashley. She was going to identify those prey items and reconstruct the nestling diet of as many of the bird, bird species in North America as she could. And here's a summary of her results. This is the uh, average nestling diet for 20 of the common bird families in North America. The green bars are the percentage of the diet that was caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we designed landscapes that did not have enough caterpillars. Most of our birds would not be able to breed successfully. So something special about caterpillars, what is it? Turns out a number of things are special about caterpillars, and one is they're soft. Think of this guy as if he is a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is its exoskeleton, its cuticle. It's made of chitin. Uh, it's undigestible. Birds don't want a lot of, of uh, chitin. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, it, it's pretty, pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of, of 200 aphids. Now, many of our smaller birds do chase aphids around. So you wanna chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. They are nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible and many beetles have very sharp edges. And finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. We have to get them from plants. And we have to get them from plants because uh, they are essential components of, of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure I have lots of carrots to get my beta carotene and lots of tomatoes to get my lycopene, lots of whatever that is to get my lutein. And she makes sure I, I have access to those things. And when I eat them, it stimulates my immune system. And I can't think of a better time to have a very healthy immune system. 
Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this prothonotary warbler male who's had access to lots of lutein's, and that's why he's bright yellow. He takes those lutein's and he makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Where is he getting his carotenoids from? From the prey items that he eats, of course, but uh, Carotenoids are not equally distributed across invertebrate prey. These first two bars are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of insects. The uh, adult caterpillars, the moths and butterflies themselves, have fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. Only the caterpillars eat green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but doesn't get any carotenoids when it gets the worm. So uh, that study and several others are suggesting the caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. Um, it really looks like they are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Let's go back to chickadees. I've got a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? Well, one or two is not, a, not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, where they fledge. And after they fledge, so that depends on the number of chicks in the nest. After they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around so, so nobody can count them. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to create a, a nest of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of, worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do because in so many places, that's all that's left is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees are only foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way where we don't have all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline uh, is a major component of the bird declines that we're, we're seeing these days. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the group that, that said we've lost three billion, or, yeah, 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the species that require insects at some part of their life history and the species that don't. So things like uh, doves and finches, they can reproduce on seeds. They didn't lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years. The species that lost numbers, that lost population size, uh, were the birds that require insects. They lost on average 10 million individuals per species. So this doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you lose insects from an environment, you lose the birds that depend on them. And you know, that's not rocket science. Take away the bird food, you're gonna lose the, the birds. So we need a new goal for, for landscaping. In the past, we've landscaped with one goal in mind, and that is to make pretty landscapes. It's all been about aesthetics. Uh, so we're not gonna abandon aesthetics, but we now need to add ecological function to our, our plant choices. We need to choose the plants that are going to support the insect life that's, that drives the rest of our food webs if we want any other animals in our ecosystems. And we do want animals in our ecosystems, so those ecosystems will collapse. So we have to add caterpillars to our landscapes. How do we do that? You do that by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. And that seems easy enough, but there is a catch. And that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which ones we, we choose. And we have to be fussy because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. This is the monarch butterfly right here. And you know that it's fussy. Uh, if you want monarchs breeding in your yard, uh, you can have all of the crepe myrtles and all the calorie pear and all of the all of the buckthorn and all of the uh, multiflora rose, all of the buckthorn or, or, or boxwood. You know the the Asian ornamentals that we 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 landscape with all the time, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to make a monarch butterfly is a milkweed. Uh, and that's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why is that? 
Well, plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be, be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they have loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic uh, compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a very effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. That's not because there are no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 96% of the, the uh, or 90% of the, the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two that are very similar in how they defend themselves and they develop the adaptations necessary, excuse me, to get around those, those defenses. They develop the enzymes, that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of evolutionary history with those, those uh, plants for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant lineage. So if you take away your, your milkweeds, your um, monarchs are not going to all of a sudden start eating hosta because that happens to be the only thing in your yard. Your monarchs are going to disappear. They are locked into eating milkweeds. So when we bring in plants from other continents, we are destroying local food webs, and that's the problem. All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild functional food webs where we've dismantled nature, we've got to choose our plants very carefully, or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work uh, when we do choose the right plants. Remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to build functional food webs outside of our parks and preserves. We're trying to connect them with functional habitat. Oh, let's go back. That's my house right there. Um, my wife and I bought 10 acres of a farm that was broken up not, not that long ago. It was a very old farm, been farmed for 300 years. Uh, and it was the last thing they did was mow it for hay. So there were very few plants there when we moved in. The goal was to rebuild the, the food web, the, ec the ecological function on this, this dilapidated farm here. And the only way you're going to do that is to put the plants in to support the caterpillars and support the food web that I've been talking about. Uh, so one of the first things I tried was to connect, uh, was to attract the Canadian outlet. That's what a Canadian outlet looks like. It's a pretty little caterpillar. That's what the adult looks like. But you're not going to attract the Canadian outlet unless you have meadow rue. That is the only plant that it eats. And we didn't have any meadow rue. Um, and I'm sure there was meadow rue here 300 years ago, but long gone, the place was farmed to death. Uh, so, uh, and I don't know where there's any meadow root anywhere nearby. So I got some seeds from someplace else, planted my meadow root, grew very nicely. Um, but, you know, this was early on. Uh, I really had very little faith that uh, the Canadian outlet would be able to find my little patch of, of meadow rue. So I planted it and then I, I didn't even go out and check it for at least two months. Um, then I walked by for another reason and looked at my, my meadow rue and it was loaded with Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. So this was a, a huge success. I'm still surprised at how fast they found it. So now we have a good population of meadow rue and Canadian outlets. We've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer, by the way. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. I did know where there was some ditch daisy in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them. They grew very nicely. Well, it took a year for the, the uh, goldenrod stowaway to find my, my bites, but it finally did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. So now we've added four species to the property. One of the hackberry emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it's a, it's a butterfly that ought to be here. It's one of the species that should be on our property. But as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry, on celtus. We didn't have hackberry, so I planted hackberry. Uh, we had to wait four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry, but they finally did. Last June, I 
looked at one of the branches on, on one of my hackberries, there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So another big success. Now we've added six species to the property. And that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own. And along with it came many of the things that eat goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't come. That's what the caterpillars look like. But this is part of the fun. This is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I, I look at my goldenrod trying to find goldenrod flower moth. One of these years I will find it and that will be a great day. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. Um, it, you know, it's a great native plant, although I hear people don't like it. I just don't know why they don't like it. It makes nutritious berries for the birds. They're very high in fat, wonderful for, for fall migration. It's an excellent pollinator plant. It does not have big showy flowers. When you're planting a, a pollinator garden, you should plant the plants that support pollinators the best. And a lot of times those are not big showy flowers. So you think like a pollinator, don't think like a human. It has good fall color. It can climb uh, your trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. Um, and the reason I planted it is it's the primary host plant for the big sphinx moths that are the principal part of cardinal diets, uh, particularly when they're breeding. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Want to see if I get the double tooth prominence just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you've got to love this guy. It's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. And of course the Dutch elm disease took out uh, the elms in most areas. Uh, so we didn't have any elms, but there are a couple of big elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make a lot of seeds. So I scooped up some of those seeds from the curb, planted them at home big success. Um, they, they grew very fast. That was 19 years ago and those trees are now 80 feet tall. And the double tooth prominent came right away. That's American elm. Uh, wanted the evening primrose moth just because it's, it's a beautiful moth. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, we didn't have any evening primrose, but uh, so I planted it and the moth came and spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. I want to, those are just examples of the plants I put on our property, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Maybe some of you have seen it. Uh, it's enormous. And people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. Um, and I hear people say, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to plant an oak because uh, I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. You will not live long enough. But if you can enjoy what your oak is delivering to your property, to the ecosystem in your property, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or as two-foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild the food web by attracting all the moths that are that food web. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, the juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of caterpillars have come to the oaks on our property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. So you don't have to wait hundreds of years for your, your oaks to start to support the life around you. This is what our house looks like today. I'm sitting right, right there is my Zoom room. I show you this picture to convince you that we're very traditional. We've got some lawn here, but I put a lot of plants back. I'm still adding plants to the property. And every time I add a new lineage of plant to the property, there's a chance I will attract new species of moths that specialize on that plant. And four years ago, I decided to uh, take up the challenge of taking a picture of every species of moth that is now living where it used to be mowed for hay, where there wasn't much here. 
I'm still at it, but I am now up to 1108 species of moths that I have taken pictures of on our property. Now we have, we have 10 acres, but Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandth of the land mass, we're, we now have 40% of all the moss species that occur in Pennsylvania. And because so many of those species are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we saw uh, last fall. World Wildlife Fund says we, Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking, not at our house. I, I am sure we have increased biodiversity by at least two thirds and it didn't take that long. And we did it simply by putting the plants back. So, you know, these, these are frightening headlines, but, but please do not give up. We can turn this around. All you have to do is put the plants back. But I know what you're thinking. Uh, we have 10 acres and a lot of people don't have that much land. So will it work on smaller patches of property? And that's a good, that's a good question. Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy, Cindy and I have. And they're in a typical development. So what they did when they moved in, their, their yard was choked with the big invasive plant in Kirkwood, Missouri, which is bush honeysuckle. Um, Amur honeysuckle from, from Asia. So they got rid of that and then they planted a lot of native plants. I'm gonna have to ask them how many species they planted. And they put in a little water feature they call a bubbler and then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. And they're up to 149 species that have used their yard, including 35 warbler species. Now just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it, does it work on, on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because right on the other side of this wall is one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam only has one-tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. And she's not connected to any natural area at all. So it's, it's one-tenth acre, which is, is a little isolated island. It's a pretty one-tenth acre, but uh, she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive plants, planted 60 species of native plants, put in a water feature, and then she sat back and started to count her birds. And she's up to 120 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house. What about city centers though? You know, 82% of us live in cities in North America now. Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa. People call it butterfly weed, but that, you know, that reminds me, we've got a, a marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed anymore. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. All right, 2014, I'm staring at Monarch's Delight. And the first thing I see are two species of leafcutter bee, of megachylic bee, a big one and a small one. Um, I know they're leafcutter bees because they carry their pollen on their tummy. Leafcutter bees have very very strict requirements. Um, they Not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they also need soft leaves. Leaves of red bud are perfect uh, because they carve out the edges of those leaves. They leave little semicircle. You might've noticed them before. And they roll up what they carved out with their mandibles into a tube, stuff it full of pollen, lay an egg on it, and then stuff that whole package into a crack or a crevice. And that is how they reproduce. Well, there was a red bud growing right next to the monarch's delight. And I'm sure that's why they were, there were leafcutter bees there. They had everything they needed. Pretty sure that's why there were bumblebees there as well. A couple of species of bumblebees. Remember, bumblebees overwinter as queens. So when they come out in the springtime, it's just the queen. There's no workers to help them. They've got to start the colony and do all the work themselves. So they need access to uh, abundant forage, a lot of pollen and a lot of nectar that's easy to get. And that's exactly what red bud provides. And then I saw a monarch. Actually, I saw two monarchs foraging on Monarch's Delight. Now, this was 2014. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. And this was June, which is pretty early in the season to see monarchs up this far, far north on the, the Atlantic coast. Um, so I was impressed. Uh, remember, 2013 was the low point of the monarch population. 
uh, only 3.6% of the monarchs left compared to 1976. So seeing monarchs this early in the season in 2014 gave me hope maybe the monarchs weren't going to disappear after all. Why were they there? Well, they had monarchs to light. There was another milkweed there as well. I think it's purple milkweed. Um, so they had, they had nectar, but they also had their host plant. They could lay their eggs, they could reproduce everything they needed. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. If you don't know, uh, the High Line it was, an, it was an elevated railroad that had been abandoned for decades. Somebody went up and saw there were a lot of native plants growing up there. So they decided to invest in it, make it a tourist destination with a nice planting uh, along the edge there. Uh, and it's been extremely successful. Millions of people go to the High Line every, every year, 30 feet above the taxis, right in the middle of, of Manhattan. But this is an exposure to nature that everybody enjoys. Uh, there's the Monarch's Delight. This is Rick Dark. He was always after me to go see the plantings on the High Line. But you know, I'm not much of a city boy and, and you know, seeing beautiful plants that have nothing using them is actually depressing to me. So I, I, I dragged my feet, but finally he got me there and I found in 20 minutes, I saw all the things I just described to you. Somebody has just finished a study of the, the native bees that are using the High Line. They're up to 30 species right now. So I was completely wrong in thinking nothing would be able to find this little strip of planting on the, the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. And it's convinced me that, that thoughtful native plantings can bring um, parts of nature back to almost anywhere. There are four things we need to think about, though, if we're going to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we've got to shrink the area that we have in lawn. We've got more than 40 million acres of, of lawn nationwide. And that's a 2005 statistic, so it's a lot more at this point. That's land dedicated to uh, a status symbol, which is an ecological deadscape. Uh, so, I, we're, you know, we humans need our status symbols. We need to convince our neighbors that we are, are good people. Uh, so we're not going to get rid of lawn, but I suggest we cut it in half, put in important plants in the other half. The, the lawn we keep, we will still manicure. We will still project our, our, our high status. But if we cut the area of lawn in half, we can build a new national park. We'll have 20 million acres to put towards conservation. And if we do it at home, our national park can be called Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, plus Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Adipolis Park, still less than 20 million acres. What do you get when you, when you put a park at home? You get the chance to develop a personal relationship with the natural world at your own pace, at your own time, all you have to do is go outside. You can do it by avoiding crowds. Uh, it, you know, if you go to a real national park, there are millions of people there. It's free, there's no admission fee, no travel hassles, but you get to experience that natural world alone. And I don't see how you can develop that personal relationship with the natural world unless it is one-on-one, -on -one, not mediated by somebody else. This is particularly important for our kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder. They got no exposure to nature. So we're trying, we, we get uh, you know 30 kids and a teacher, put them on a bus and they drive for an hour to a natural area. Then they walk around for an hour and get back on the bus. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Get back on the bus and they go, go home. And I'm sure that's better than nothing, but um, it's really an exposure to 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not, not to touch anything. If they have some part of the natural world at home, all they have to do is go outside and discover it, develop a relationship with it alone, no parental supervision. Let them build independent relationships with the natural world, which is critically important because they are the future stewards of our planet. And if they don't have a relationship with the natural world, they're gonna be lousy stewards. And maybe they'll learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of, of nature. It's a 10 by 10 piece of grass and a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. And when she discovered that, she, she figured out how to hunt lizards and she sent me this picture to explain it. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. Uh, no smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, 
You catch the lizard, you put it in, in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of it. You develop that personal relationship that will tie you to the natural world. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be uh, crawling on the ground catching lizards in her best dress the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture uh, not long ago, so who knows. But I guarantee she's gonna remember catching lizards in, in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I guarantee she's gonna be a good steward of the planet because of it. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of, of how to introduce your kids to nature right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, go to our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and get yourself on the map. Uh, follow the directions for uh, you're essentially registering, registering where you live and the amount of, of lawn or, or anything else that you're going to convert and protect uh, by planting native plants. This is our attempt at, at reaching beyond the choir. I've been talking to the choir for, for the last 15 years, um, but most people are not in the choir. Most people don't realize how important their little piece of the earth is. Um, so this, we're, you know, you can, you can go on the map and see who else in your county is doing this, uh, maybe make some connections that way. We have over 8,000 people that have, have joined the map. The object is to reach that 20 million acres of, of lawn, and we are well on our way. By the way, it's free and no, we're not using your, your data. Um, so we're gonna shrink the lawn, that's number one. Number two, what plants are we gonna put in the area that was lawn? Well, some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of that arch. And if you take that stone out, the arch collapses. Well, if you take a keystone plant out of the local food web, the food web collapses because it's making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of that caterpillar food that drives our food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives us food webs. So think of, of the, the uh, keystone plants in your, your yard as if you're building a, an ecological house. They are the two by fours of that ecological house. They are essential. They're gonna hold up that house they're not the only things you're gonna build your house out of. Uh, you, you know, you can't build a house out of, out of wallpaper though, but, it, but they, they're the starting uh, blocks. You've got to have those keystone plants um, or you will have a failed food web. The question no longer is simply, are natives better than non-natives? On average, they, they, uh, they are, but there are a lot of natives that are not contributing that much either. So let's focus on the ones that are the hyperproductive ones, that are ones that are supporting our pollinators and our caterpillars better than other species. I get uh, an email once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia actually grew in North America 7 million years ago? That makes them native. That means we can plant them. That means everything will be great. But yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in, in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not gonna have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not, it's whether they're doing anything or not, whether they're productive. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago, they support zero species of caterpillars. They are not, not supporting that food web. So they're there, they're taking up space, but they're not supporting the food web. What supports a food web better than any other plant genus in North America? It's oaks. Genus Quercus, 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic states supported by oaks, over 950 species nationwide. No other plant genus comes close to that. This is what keystone oaks are doing in, in our yard here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Now remember, so far I've taken a picture of 1,108 moss species. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, I will. But of those 1,108 species, 969 have known host plants. So there's, there's more than 100, we don't know what they're eating. Of the 969, 285 species use oaks. Now we have 69 genera of native woody plants on our property. And only one of them is a genus Quercus. And we've got hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. But they're supporting 29% of our moss species diversity. So imagine what would happen if we took that one genus of plant, that one keystone plant out of our yard. 
we'd have a tremendous dip in the diversity that, that is using our yard. That's the power of keystone plants. How do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website. You put in your zip code and the ranked list of both woody and herbaceous plants, uh, the ones best at supporting caterpillars will pop up for your county. This is what typical lists look like. Um, I stopped because I, I ran out of room, um, not because these are the only keystone plants. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and I say, I wanna buy a cherry, they're gonna sell me an, an ornamental cherry from Asia. If I say I wanna buy a willow, they'll try to sell me a weeping willow from Turkey. If I wanna buy a birch, it'll probably be a European birch. Maple, a, a Japanese maple. You've gotta specify that you want a native member of these important genera, because if you get non-native members, you'll reduce caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. These are the top herbaceous uh, plants in terms of, not just in terms of supporting um, uh, caterpillars. Goldenrods, for example, support 110 species of caterpillars, but they also are best at supporting the specialist bees that are out there, the bees that are specializing on the pollen of particular plants. If I plant goldenrods, the various genera that asters have been broken up into, and perennial sunflowers, there are over 40 species of bees in New England that will be, that have the opportunity of being in my yard. If I don't plant them, um, that's 40 species that can't be in my yard. So that's the power of keystone plants. Um, if you're from Canada, I don't know if anybody's from Canada here, there's a similar website that will guide you in, in gardening for wildlife up there. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to plant keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of, of uh, insects to our yard. And then we're going to kill them with our security light, which of course is not the goal. There's a lot of research that suggests that uh, light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines. These are uh, some of the ways that, uh, that that security light you have on at night is killing our insects, particularly our, our moths. Uh, and to me, this is actually good news, believe it or not. We have to turn around insect declines, not just stop it, but turn it around. We've lost 45% of the insects on planet Earth and we're, we're suffering because of it. Our ecosystems are suffering. That's why we're losing 3 billion birds and all those things. So we've got to turn that around. If we can do that by simply flicking a switch, turning off your, your lights at night, we're getting off easy because that's awfully easy to do. But I know what you're going to say. Oh, I can't turn the light out over my garage because um, the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your, your security light. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to realize is the bad man does not come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb that is out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is the best. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than our white wavelengths. So if we switched out our, our white bulbs and security lights overnight, if we switch them out for yellow bulbs, we would save billions of insects and probably billions of dollars too because LED lights are much more energy efficient. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants. We're gonna turn out our lights. Then we're gonna invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our insects. This is a booming business all around the country. Uh, Mosquito Joe is, is undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 15 years. Uh, but he says, well, it's okay because this is a natural product. Uh, and it is a natural product. It's a pyrethroid that uh, it's made from chrysanthemums. But, you know, cyanide is a natural product too. So I'm not sure that's a good argument. He also says it only kills mosquitoes and that's not even close to true. Uh, I don't know if you saw the headlines last year, but major monarch kills, hundreds of monarchs killed when they flew through Mosquito Joe's fog last during last fall's migration. Uh, this stuff kills all the insects it comes in contact with. But what's, what's interesting um, and ironic is it does not control the mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50% of them. He's not even close to, to working. And that's why he has to keep coming back. And that's why he has to keep charging you. So he's expensive, kills lots of non-targets, and it doesn't work. The way you kill mosquitoes is, is this way. You get a bucket and you fill it full of water. People say, how big a bucket? doesn't matter, the bigger the butter. Put in a handful of straw or hay and let it ferment for a couple of days. This hot weather is great for that. 
um, it, you're, what you're doing is building up the populations of diatoms and algae that are in your bucket. And that becomes irresistible to mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs. They will lay your eggs, their legs, their eggs in your bucket. Then you put in a mosquito dunk. You go to the hardware store, get a mosquito dunk. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a, uh, it's a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is mosquito larvae. Uh, so if you get a dragonfly in there, it's not going to hurt it. If you if you if uh, your dog licks it or a bird drinks it, it's not going to hurt it at all. You put in the mosquito dunk, the larvae chew on it, and they die. It's targeted, only kills mosquitoes. It's cheap uh, and has a much better chance of working than mosquito gel. Fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows our caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. Um, you know, I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Uh, and this is not just true for oaks, it's true for caterpillars on trees everywhere. Most of the species finish growing on the, the leaves of the tree and then they drop from the tree and wiggle their way underneath the ground and pupate underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree, not the way we landscape. And we mow and compact the soil under our trees so that there is rock hard and the caterpillars can't get underground to pupate. So this becomes an ecological trap and we landscape like this pretty much everywhere. It's an ecological trap because we call in the adults, they lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, and then uh, they drop down and die. And of course, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option. This is what most people do. You have a big tree in a yard with, with grass. Nobody's measured how well caterpillars survive in a situation like this, but, um, and we're doing that this summer. But I guarantee they're gonna survive better in a situation like this, where you have a tree, then you have a layered landscape, maybe a dogwood here and a native azalea and some ferns and ground cover. Caterpillars drop down to a safe site. They can easily get underground. The soil is not compacted and they can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under there. This is where you do your spring ephemeral gardening. Put a, put a big bed around your trees. The bigger, the better. Safe site. This is where you can use your, your uh, uh, native ground covers, things like wild ginger, foam flower, may apple, ferns. This is Athens, Georgia. It's a hotel in Athens, Georgia. Um, any, this, these are red maples. Any caterpillar developing on the red maple can drop down into these ferns and complete its development, even though it's the middle of a city. We can do a lot better with how we landscape under our trees. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, uh, has done some wonderful work with chickadees in the, the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and her results suggest there is room for compromise uh, in our plant choices. What she did was look at how well chickadee populations are supported by landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by introduced ornamentals. And uh, First thing she found is that there are 75% fewer caterpillars when the landscapes are dominated by introduced ornamentals. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Their nest box is up in each, each yard, but uh, the chickadees would come and they'd, they'd say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, those nests contain 1.5 fewer eggs. The clutches were 29% less likely to survive. If they did survive, those nests produce 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to reach maturity. And if you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native plant, woody plant biomass in your yard, this is what you get. We focused on woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage. This dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies uh, in order to replace the adults that die every, every year. The chickadees don't live very long. If you breed at this rate, that is a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, that's a growing population. But if you make fewer babies than adults die, that's a shrinking, unsustainable population. And that's what you get as soon as you have more than 
of your landscape, non-native woody plants. That's where those lines overlap. Uh, but you know, this is this is good news because you can have your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your boxwood, as long as it's not invasive and as long as it doesn't dominate the landscape. So as long as 70% of your native plants or of your of your woody plants are native. You can have those those other plants. And that's, you know, I'm excited about that because if my message was you can't have any non-native plants, very few people would listen to me um, because we love our non-native plants. Remember, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. So let's get more of these guys into our landscapes and we can we can tolerate some of these. Can native plants be used in formal designs? Of course they can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy uh, design. She sent it to me a couple of weeks ago. This was taken from a drone about 400 feet up. This is a big garden. It, you don't get more formal than this. And every plant in that, that uh, garden is a native plant. So formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in, in uh, uh, gardens in Europe all the time informal gardens in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a little fence around it. It defines it, it, it shows that it's intentional. There's a lot of species in here. Um, it, you know, it's not very big, but it'll still, it'll still uh, meet the needs of a number of, of native bees. <coughs> Let's, let's review why we need pollinators again. You hear all the time you need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. That's a really anthropogenic, anthropogenic view of why we need pollinators. It's also not accurate. May Berenbaum, the University of, of Illinois has, has looked at that figure and trying to figure out where it came from. The closest she can come up with is uh, about a 12th of our crops are supported by, by pollinators. We eat a lot of corn and, and wheat, by the way, which are wind pollinated. Doesn't mean we don't need pollinators. Pollinators pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, not an option. Where do we need those pollinators? Everywhere, not just in parks and preserves, but everywhere. Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this design? That's a Drew Latham design, it's much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. It's a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more of them are doing that. Minnesota has uh, one of the oldest programs. It's called a lawn to legume program. It's a cost sharing program where the state is helping people uh, reduce the area they have in lawn and by replacing it with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's very successful. Pennsylvania has got a new lawn conversion program. You get up to $5,000 per acre to convert your, your big lawn into a, a native planting. It was designed to help watersheds, but uh, it'll certainly help biodiversity at the same time. Florida, there's an island off of Florida that is paying people to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. They're paying them to do that. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're gonna pay you to take care of it. Everybody would want one. Missouri and Fayetteville, Arkansas had a, a uh, bounty on calorie pears, one of our most invasive uh, plants. Take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. And even public utilities are getting into the act, giving San Antonio, giving people $100 coupons to put in water efficient native plants and get rid of the uh, non-native ones that gobble up the water. And of course the big lawn conversion programs in the far west, California, where they don't have any water at all, certainly not for, for lawns. $2 per square foot rebate if you take out a lawn and put in appropriate xeric planting. I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one's a serious one. Somehow we've come to think of nature as optional, that we don't need it, that it's not essential. And of course, if it's, if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, um, it, nature will take a back seat. You know, and, and there's always a shortage of resources. So nature's always taking a, a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and there's this wall sized poster there which epitomizes, in my view, uh, our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife so that future generations can enjoy it. 
That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We want to we want to save these places so the future generations can can enjoy them. And I get that, but you know it suggests it suggests that nature's uh, there just to entertain us, and it's far more than that. We need to save nature, we need to save wildlife so that we have future generations, a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this. If we restrict conservation just to the untouched areas, those little habitat fragments that we have, we've condemned them to, to failure because those areas are too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. David Quammen has a superior uh, analogy between a, a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That's a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that, I hate the terminology because it suggests they're places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, stitch it back together again by putting those important plants back not just to make biological corridors that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats outside of our parks and preserves, right? Where we live, where we work, where we farm, where we play, where we go to school, where we worship. For the first time in modern history, we are going to coexist with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists few ecologists, few conservation biologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet, but I don't know why, because every person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody, everybody bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We've been really good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations towards good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean that you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, right now, so many of us feel powerless. The earth, earth problems are huge. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink their lawn, one person can, can take out their, their invasive plants, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can use keystone plants, one person can turn out their lights, one person can completely revitalize the little ecosystem on their property and, and uh, enhance their local ecosystem rather than degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't, don't think about the entire planet's problems. You'll get depressed. Just worry about your piece of the planet. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Volunteer, help, help a park or preserve. Land conservancy, they're all underfunded, all understaffed, they will love you. So as property owners or volunteers, each one of us has the power and the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate. You know, this, this biodiversity crisis that we've created is a global problem, but it has a grassroots solution. To succeed, we need to stop being adversaries of the natural world. We've got to start collaborating with nature. I will know when we have succeeded when restorations are no longer necessary. Because we're gonna, we're gonna build right from the start with ecosystem function in mind. We won't need to reduce huge acres of lawn because we won't put them in to begin with. We won't need to get rid of our invasive plants because we won't buy them at the nurseries to begin with. We won't need to favor keystone plants or to install pollinator gardens because they will be automatic parts of every single landscape. That's my dream. I hope you, hope you help me realize it. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Doug. That was really, really amazing. Um, I cannot thank you enough for, for distilling your thoughts so well. Um, 
I, I, we do have a lot of, well, actually, I take that back. You speak so well and so thoroughly. We don't have a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> but, uh, but Robin and I will, will go through and answer some questions. Um, uh, they, they start with, with the very basic one. Um, oh, and I should say, like, we will actually wrap up at about 8.30. We do, uh, we try to um, respect everybody's time since this has, actually was on the, uh, the um, schedule for uh, 7 to 8.30. So don't worry. If you have to leave at 8.30, that is absolutely fine. Um, don't worry. We will, you can let yourself out the door if you need to go quietly. Um, so the first question was, clearly from somebody who had taken your advice before and had converted to leaving the leaves, but lost dozens of perennials grown from wild seeds um, it, because of voles who had tunneled under the leaf litter. Um, and so a couple of our listeners had actually had the same question. How do you, what strategies can you suggest to prevent leaving the leaves from creating a vole explosion? You know, I've never gotten that question. <laughs> <laughs> I have had trouble from voles uh, girdling young trees, and and that is frustrating. You know, you grow a beech tree from a seed, uh, you wait five years, and then the vole kills it. Uh, so I sympathize. Uh, I hadn't I hadn't had the perennial problem. There Boy, might have also it, because I've experienced this a little bit myself, where it, there, there's a little bit of smothering with the super young. You, you, know, you can't. You you have to be gentle with the leaves. You can't pile in feet of them because it will it will smother some of those plants. Although I'm doing a little experiment now with flocks and um, a lot of the spring ephemerals, where I didn't touch, I didn't remove a single leaf. They all popped up through it just fine, and no vole damage. And I've got a lot of voles too. I also have mm -hmm. owls and foxes and all those things that eat voles that might help but all right that's a new problem that i that i hadn't thought about <laughs> um but you know bare ground is is no good uh either mm -hmm. so you've got to protect that soil community and do that with with leaves boy life is just a trade-off uh, <laughs> no i think you have a very good point about the the full the full web including the predators on the voles yeah so you, might you know, vol, vol population, they're an outbreak species. They can really cycle. And maybe you're just at the top of a cycle and, and it's unfortunate. Um, I'll, I'll have to think about that one. I'm sorry that's happening. <laughs> I uh, did have a family of foxes in my yard last year that we were able to observe very closely. And voles were a big, big part of their diet. So invite yeah. some foxes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if you can. Yeah. You know, they're pretty good I, with people. They, they'll they nest under your garage and stuff. They don't They, they don't care. should, yeah. yeah. Uh, our next question was if you have advice on how to control invasive insects that native birds don't eat, such as the brown tail moth caterpillar in mid-coast Maine, without harming the beneficial pollinators in their habitats. Yes, um, another huge problem we, we've created. When I say we need insects, I am not talking about invasive insects. I'm not talking about insects from other continents. Um, because they're here without their natural enemies. And that's the problem. They, they don't have the natural controls that would keep them in check. Uh, and many of these guys, the ones that have become particularly problematic are hairy. Our birds don't like hairy insects. They don't care whether they're native or not, but they don't like hairy insects. They don't like gypsy moth. They don't like brown tail moth. They do like winter moth, by the way. And, uh, and, and that control is working pretty well. But... Um, the yellow bill and black bell cuckoo are exceptions. They specialize on hairy caterpillars. Uh, the problem is we don't we don't have enough yellow bill or black bill cuckoos. So now we have to make terrible decisions. You get these these defoliating populations, uh, particularly attacking oaks, the best plant. Do you let them kill your oak, or do you control them with with a BT spray, Bacillus thuringiensis? Of course, if you spray your oak, you're going to kill all the caterpillars on your oak, and it takes out its productivity that, that year. But you don't want to lose a 100-year oak either. So, you know, it's a, it's a judgment call. Um, I do know that at least with gypsy moth, there is a very effective fungus that breaks out when it is moist enough, and it'll completely control the population. Get it? You know, you won't even notice them for, for a decade. But uh, particularly in New England, you had, you had several dry years in a row, and that's 
what has triggered your, your gypsy moth outbreak. There's no fungal controlling it. I don't know how your, your rain was this spring, but uh, if you got a fair amount of rain, maybe it'll knock those guys down. But controlling these invasive uh, plants and the invasive insects is just a huge problem. There is no easy solution to it other than to try to stop bringing them in. That doesn't help us with the ones that are already here, but we keep doing it. I mean, down where we are now, we've got the spotted lantern fly. It's only been here three or four years, but we brought it in because it was egg masses on white Chinese rocks. And we absolutely had to have Chinese rocks because we don't have any rocks in North America that we could we could use. So you got to bring in the Chinese one. We keep doing this to ourselves. And so, you know, and then people say, hey, you fix it. <laughs> yeah, I, somebody asked me a question I can answer, please. <laughs> well, I'm going to go with the just so we don't miss our chance question. Um, so could you show the picture of the Persian rugs with the trees around them? Because um, I have to sh screen share again. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember who asked it, but they, they wanted to grab a screenshot, and it's a really effective metaphor. The Persian rug metaphor is fantastic, and I, I also really like how you express the gluing it back together. Well, remember, that is David Quammen's analogy, not, not mine. Mm -hmm. it, but it is, but it is, it is powerful. Um, yeah. So let's see. There we go. Is that that's what you want? Mm, it's not shared for me. Is that shared for you, Robin? Oh, really? No, it, it looks like you were briefly sharing and then it went away. Okay, rats. Um, oh, no. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay, let me try it again. Screen share. There we go. How's that? There you go. That's fantastic. Okay, so let's let's all admire that while we ask the rest of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, good. <laughs> Here's a real question. Um, do you have any tips on how to spot the caterpillars on the plants? Um, one of the listeners says that they have a lot of the keystone species, but rarely sees the caterpillar. So for those yeah. of us who don't have eagle eyes for, for bugs, what do we look for? Well, keep, keep that in mind when you say, aren't all these caterpillars gonna defoliate my plants? The, it's usually this problem. I can't find all the caterpillars. Um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of tricks to it. First of all, you want to look in the right time of the season. This is the worst time of year to look for caterpillars because the birds are just finishing breeding and they have eaten them all, or at least it seems that way. They're bringing about hundreds, hundreds for every nest in your yard. And it, it, you know, it's hard to find them after that. The best time to look for caterpillars is late July and early August when the populations build up again. Um, right now, uh, uh, most of the caterpillars are actually in the adult stage. They're, they're moths. Um, and notice I'm talking about moths. Butterflies actually contribute very little to, to the food web. So we're really talking about moths. For every species of butterfly, we have 19 species of moths. Uh, so you have to wait for these guys to lay their eggs, and then the caterpillars will develop. Um, but the caterpillars are doing their very best to hide from you. They don't, if you can find them, so can the birds. So many of them, their best trick the best defense is to eat at night. They hide during the day, and sometimes that means it crawling entirely off the tree and then coming back up at night. If you go out with a flashlight at night and one of those flat LED lights are, are a really good option and just shine it up into the, the leaves, you will find, you will find caterpillars. Um, but they're looking like you know leaf damage, they'll hide on bark. They're very cryptic. They're doing the best they can. If you have a brightly colored caterpillar, it means it's it doesn't taste good. They're advertising it. Um, so, and they're they're easier to find. But uh, you're developing what we call a search image, and once you develop the search image, it, it becomes easier to find them. But those are some some tricks that you can That's use. That's a great tip. Okay, next to you, Robin. <laughs> okay, I think that you spoke to this um, somewhat with homegrown national parks, but Matthew asked if there's a way to restore the environment with a similar plan to FDR's remedy for the Dust Bowl, um, sort of rebooting the Civilian Conservation Corps. Well, um, yes. The, the issue is that most of this has to happen on private land. So you could have a, 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 you know, a government-funded agency as a bunch of strangers coming onto your property and doing this. I'm not opposed to that at all, um, but uh, 
right now that you know even if even if there was the political will to do that we don't have the trained individuals what we what we do have is a, an enormous lawn care industry um, I would love to retrain them and call them ecological landscapers so that uh, they could just keep up the same contract they already have most people don't garden themselves they hire somebody I want people to be able to hire ecological landscapers or ecological gardeners. The, per, the homeowner doesn't have to know anything. They just hire the people and say, do it. And they will know how to install these, these plants. They'll know how to maintain them, how, how to, uh, you know, care for them. Um, you know, you get, get a good one, you'll, they'll know how to design your, your landscape. Remember, we're not going to get rid of the lawn. The lawn's going to be where you, where you walk. So, you know, how is that artfully laid out? Uh, all, a lot of that takes, takes knowledge and, and skill. So um, we need to train. It's a big job opportunity, big business opportunity. Before the you know, COVID, I went and talked all over the country and people would always say, who can I hire? And most of the time I'd say, I don't know who you can hire. But um, this is a solvable problem. We just need to create these people. If we do it with, with uh, you know, an FDR type program, that's okay but um, that sounds temporary to me. So I'd rather have a permanent uh, niche filled with, with an entire industry of ecological landscapers. I want this to become uh, a normal. We're talking about changing the culture. We're not gonna do it once. It's gonna be part of the culture. And that means it's gotta be woven into the fabric of our culture. It's gotta be, you know, this have to be uh, you know, permanent industries that are out there. That is, a, I'm, I will sort of end there. That is a wonderful way to bookend um, everything you've said so far. Um, but just because it is 8.30, what I want to say is thank you on everybody to say thank you because this really has been amazing. Um, Robin and I are incredibly proud to, to have been able to host you. We'll keep asking questions if you guys want to stay. <laughs> Um, but I'll, I did I'll, want to take an I'll opportunity yeah. for, for us to say thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, You're welcome. That was a really great bookend. So let's get back into it. <laughs> let's get back into it. Um, a neighbor has Virginia creeper in a row of rhododendron. So it looks like the rhododendron is being compromised by the Virginia creeper. Is it? Could it be the fault of the creeper um, or is it something else? What's the question? Is it really Virginia creeper or? Well, is could the Virginia creeper be actually compromising a rhododendron? Uh, if it covers it, I suppose, uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's a vine. Vines grow, they grow up on things. <laughs> and and uh, I can tell you one thing, in terms of ecological productivity, the Virginia creeper has it all over the rhod rhododendron, which contributes almost nothing. But I get it. The rhododendron is a is a decoration. Um, cut the cut the Virginia creeper off that and plant it someplace else. There are lots of places where it can be. It's a great ground cover too. So it climbs. It's a ground cover. Don't put it near the house. I I've done that, and um, it it'll grow up over your house too. And I guess that's why people don't don't like it. But um, there's plenty of places you can put it. If you have an old snag. Or if a tree dies, you know, the gypsy moth kills one of your oaks, leave it there uh, unless it's next to the house and then plant the Virginia creeper at the base. And, and that the snag is a great place for the birds to, to nest, the, particularly the woodpeckers. And then the Virginia creeper makes it a green plant again. So two pluses there. I have quite a bit of green uh, of Virginia creeper in my backyard, and I momentarily forgot why I, why it was worthwhile because, like, <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, somebody's gonna have to remind me why this is worthwhile, and it, you did. Uh, <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> Tag, you're it, Robin. <laughs> okay. Um, does the presence of a body of water among the native plants accelerate the adoption of the garden by the invertebrates? Um, probably not, but it may accelerate the adoption by birds because birds need those insects, but they also need a constant supply of water. They're taking drinks all the time and they really like moving water. So that's why that's why these bubblers are really good. Just a little feature that that makes the water move because that is signals to the bird that it's clean water, as opposed to still stagnant water um, that's more likely to have high loads of, of uh, algae and you know what things that the birds are not looking for. So a bird will always go to a moving stream or a little little trickle. Um, 
the insects are going for the plants. Uh, so they, unless it's an aquatic insect, they of course need the water, but uh, the terrestrial insects don't, don't care that much about the water. So going back to the, the controlling versus encouraging, um, someone has carpenter ants and wants to control the carpenter ants, but not harm the birds that can eat them. So what's the technique there? Depends on where the carpenter ants are. If the nest of the carpenter ant is in your house, and a lot of people think, particularly with the name, that carpenter ants are like termites, that they're eating the wood. They're not eating the wood. They will hollow out wood that is already compromised, typically by dry rot, uh, they, and they just, they make a space and their, their nest is there. Uh, and then, you know, particularly in the springtime, they could forage in your kitchen looking for little bits of sugar and other things you've left behind. Uh, a lot of times the nest is in a tree in your backyard and they'll still come into your kitchen looking for the, the sugar. Um, but they're not hurting the, the tree or the house at all. It's, they're just taking advantage of damage that has already occurred. So, uh, so there's no, no reason to actually get rid of the carpenter ants. Um, you have to tolerate them because they will be there, but they're not, but they're not hurting anything. So a lot of people think they're, oh, they're damaging my house. I got to get rid of them, but they're, they're not. It's it, the termites you do have to get rid of. Okay. Hmm. Great question. Great answer. Let's see. Uh, Nancy has an acre that was a hay field. How could she remodel it to support pollinators? Um, she can't afford to plow to begin with new soil? Well, um, you know, we live in the east where we get a lot of rain and the eastern eastern prairie, eastern meadow used to be a feature of all of our landscapes, but it was always a transitional one. It was moving towards forest. Uh, so a lot of people think that the easiest way to increase native plants is to create a, a meadow um, and this is what she's talking about. Unfortunately, it's actually one of the hardest things to do because it doesn't want to stay meadow. You're, take, you're changing it from something. So right now it's in hay. Uh, you know, you'd have to convert it to all the native plants. You can do that. The easiest way to do that is with your mowing schedule where you mow vigorously in the spring and then by uh, maybe... June 20th or something, you stop mowing the rest of the year. And then you do that for several springs in a row. And that'll depress the cool season European grasses and encourage the warm season um, native bunch grasses. Uh, and then, and a lot of the forbs will come in as well. So without planning a thing, but adjusting your, your mowing schedule, you can favor the natives to take over your, your hay field. Um, you want to be careful about the the birds that need that that field, your bobolinks and your meadowlarks, because um, mowing in the spring, of course, is exactly when they're nesting. Another, another trade-off. But uh, if you actually want to plant uh, uh, an acre worth of meadow with with um, forbs, um, it, that can be expensive. And you, if you you know if you start from seed, you probably want to kill everything that's there first so that your seed will get a good start. If you do plugs, that's even more expensive. And, but then you can go right in because the, the grasses that are there already are going to be very competitive. There are people that specialize in making meadows. Um, Larry Weiner and, and Associates is one of them. It makes great meadows, but it's not cheap. So. <laughs> I think you're, you're sorry. muted, Sarah. Uh, we, sorry. <laughs> uh, we put in a very small, about 400 square feet meadow in the back of our library and that felt nice and affordable because it's very very tiny yeah plus you have well, public works to do it so and another thing that i forgot to mention is it will be invaded by the non-natives on mm -hmm. a regular basis so you have yep. to you have to watch those woodies coming in mowing will not control the woodies it cuts them back but you've got that rootstock and they'll come back immediately so you need spot yep. treatment of those woodies Yep. And if you do it regularly so that they're always small, it's not a big deal. But if you let it go for two years or something, it becomes a big deal. Mm -hmm. And if it's small enough, I can actually go back and cut out some things that are, you know, before they get too big. So right. It, right. small is actually a lot easier. Right. Um, so someone asked, do sugar, uh, silver maple and crab apple trees support caterpillars? Silver maple certainly does. It's a native maple, does a good job. 
Um, and crab apples an interesting one. We have uh, a few species of native crab apples. The uh, prairie prairie crab, crab apples, one of them. But most of the crab apples that we have in, in this area, um, we brought over as ornamentals, and then they hybridized with some of, of the natives. So you may notice if you got a bunch of crab apples on your property, some some make pretty big berries, some make really tiny berries. Uh, they're very closely related which is why they hybridize. Um, but there's a lot of variability there. So even though the bulk of the genes are actually from Europe, um, it's one of these non-natives that is so closely related to the, the malice that we have in this country, that's the, the genus, that our insects for the most part don't recognize a huge, huge difference. So um, they still support a fair amount of insects as, as a hybrid non-native. If you keep crab apples on your property, I would go for the ones that make the smallest berries because those are the most accessible, accessible to the birds. Birds don't like the big fat ones, but they love those little, little guys. So you might as well, you know, actually, you know, berries in the fall, are important sources of, of nutrients for migrating birds. And, and a crab apple that makes those tiny berries uh, is, a, is a really good source of it. Great. Uh, Thomas asks, how bad is the competition from European sparrows, which are widespread here on the food resources of native birds? Um, European sparrows, is actually a finch uh, and the big competition is not so much so finches uh, can reproduce on seeds for the most part they eat a lot of seeds they do eat insects but the real competition is for nest sites those guys uh, will take over your your nest boxes they'll kick out the bluebirds and and the tree swallows so that's where the competition is with tree hole nesters uh, it's an invasive species you you legally have uh, permission to kill them. Um, a lot of people don't like to do that, but the competition is not with the food, it's with the nest site. So Robin, do you think we caught all the questions? I have two more here. Um, one is, do caterpillars occupy all parts of the tree, lower, middle, upper? Um, that's a great question. Most of the evidence is yes, but you know, it's really hard to sample the upper parts. <laughs> Nobody's done it really well. Um, I did have a, a student who followed around a, a tree crew uh, for one summer. So they were taking down big trees and they, they worked with her and, and they would they top the tree and lower the branches down, and then she'd inspect them for caterpillars. She didn't find a lot of a lot of differences. Um, we find them on lower branches because those are the ones we can we can reach. And if you're looking for for uh, cocoons of like the Polyphemus moth or the Promethea moth and Cecropia moth, they're always on the lower branches. Uh, so, you know, if there was a difference, it would be that the lower ones are favored. It's more, more humid, less windy, less dry. Uh, it's a more benign environment. But I do know there are, there are caterpillars up top too. Watch where the, the migrants forage. They're foraging all over the tree. So there are caterpillars up there. Great. We have another question that just appeared. Um, UMass Professor Robert Giger has suggested that bees are rejecting pollen from non-native plants and need specific pollen from a very limited set of plants such as Hypericum and are not bringing non-native pollen to their nests. Can you comment on this? Um, we, um, this gets back to those specialist bees where they can't use the pollen from anything other than what they've, they've specialized on. And, and none of our bees have specialized on non-native plants because they haven't, haven't been here to specialize on. Uh, so that may be what he's talking about, but, but specialist bees will also reject the pollen of, of native plants that they haven't specialized on either. So it's, it's a matter of being restricted to the pollen they specialized on. And this is confusing to a lot of people because bees, even the specialist bees, do not specialize on the nectar. They will go to lots of flowers to get nectar, just like a hummingbird will go to a hummingbird feeder. It didn't specialize on a plastic feeder, but it needs the, the sugar water. Well, so do a lot of our bees, but when they're collecting pollen to reproduce, that's when they get very specific. 
That makes a lot of sense. It does. Um, <laughs> the last question that I have here is someone wants to know if you know where um, an industrious person could obtain the schooling to offer eco-landscaping skills. So where can they get trained to do that? that uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question too. <clears throat> Um, you know, the, the, the very best training is on the job training with a company that already exists. Uh, and um, you can get that training if you find such such a, a ecological landscaper. Uh, a lot of times they'll say, well, we, you know, I can't hire anybody else, but they'll sure take volunteers. You say, I'll work for you for free because I'm getting trained for free. Uh, they'll grab that in a second. Um, so that's one option. You know, we have a, at the University of Delaware, we have a landscape architect program for, for undergrads that is uh, a lot of talk about how, how it is ecologically oriented. Um, I hope it is as ecologically oriented as they, they say. And that's all I'll say. <laughs> um, we, we do have someone who's added that the Native Plant Trust um, a Massachusetts-based organization also offers classes and that rings a bell, so. Okay, okay, good. I think you're on to something. You know, with you know uh, uh, I, I mentioned Larry Weiner. He wrote a book um, phew, whose name I can't remember, but look him up. It's, it's W-E-A-N-E-R. Uh, and it's very much of a how to, how to do ecological landscaping book. So, um, you know, there's some self-training in, involved here as well. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I have done the best that I could so far to make my backyard wild. And I've learned get your a lot of yard. things here. <laughs> my front yard is so wild this year. Okay, it has okay. grown wild flowers that we just haven't mowed it. <laughs> um, so uh, there, there's some done, putting yeah, the name of Larry's book in the, in the chat right now. I, I just missed it. Yeah. It's, Gardening, gardening revolution. Yeah, Thomas is our is. honorary librarian, I guess. So, <laughs> okay, good. That was my dog deciding. Well, he he says it's it. it's done. That's it. You know. <laughs> so, thank you so much for this talk. It has been you're, great. You're welcome. Um, you're welcome. For everybody in the chat, I'm going to be posting a couple of links where you can sign up for our newsletter and learn more about events. And also, we have a feedback form. And if you fill that out, you can win a tote bag. <laughs>